So normally it's recording. Okay. Can I go? Perfect. Yes. Okay, so um, today I'm making a presentation about prompting techniques for natural language generation with a particular focus on the medical domain, which uh, has been, as Elena said, the, the work I've uh, done uh, during my internship here at the Wemix team. Uh, so, well, uh, my internship has been done in the context of the Antidote project, uh, which uh, uh, I mean, to give a brief recap of the project itself, uh, aims uh, to provide a unified framework uh, to learn to take decision in the medical domain and at the same time explain those decisions. So before I came here, what they did was uh, um, design this whole pipeline uh, to detect the symptoms, findings and other important information from the case description. And then they focused on the symptoms. Uh, uh, and uh, another part of the pipeline that matched those symptoms with uh, uh, the symptoms of the actual diseases in the HPO, which is a medical ontology. And then they created a template based explanation for why the patient was diagnosed with uh, a certain disease or not diagnosed with a certain disease. So what was the objective of my work was trying to improve the uh, these explanations by moving away from the single template and the way in which we decided to do this was to frame the problem as a data to test to text task. So basically we took all the information that was collected from the case description and from the HPO and we structured the, uh, it as triplets. And then we had this very small kind of knowledge base, which we linearized and fed as input as text input to the language model. And the language model was supposed to output a, a, product, uh, um, a description of these, uh, these triplets, which was our explanation. So the data set, the medical data set we worked with is called USML eSIMP. And uh, uh, in practice, uh, I said before we had just one single uh, explanation for a set of triplets, so we worked to kind of augment that. And the way in which we did this was build multiple references for every sequence of triplets uh, using uh, some online paraphrasing tools. Uh, we actually tried also to use uh, um, language models that were fine-tuned for uh, paraphr paraphrasing uh, a sentence, but we ended up getting kind of uh, more of a summary uh, and less of a paraphrase. And uh, the, the thing is that if you have a whole sentence that says like, uh, the patient has not been diagnosed with this disease because this list of long symptoms is important and is missing from the case description, then the, the language model tended to kind of completely delete the, the list of symptoms and just uh, say uh, the patient has not been diagnosed with uh, this disease because uh, uh, relevant symptoms are missing and that's it, which obviously was not what we were going for. So we ended up uh, in the end uh, using these uh, online paraphrasing tools. Uh, once we had augmented uh, the data set with multiple references for every triplet, uh, we uh, obviously built the three splits, uh, train, validation and test, and in particular we ended up with a uh, uh, modestly sized uh, training data set of uh, uh, 10,000 examples. And one thing I want to point out, and the relevance of this will become uh, clearer later, is that uh, we could uh, extract uh, category information about the disease or the symptoms from the HPO ontology, but this is not included in the current version of the data set. So for now, we don't have this category information. What I mean for category information is, for example, the, the category of the disease. So maybe uh, it's cardiovascular disease or an immuno, uh, depressive one or whatever. So uh, I mean for category like the, the category of the disease. So here we have a couple of examples of uh, our triplets and uh, some of the references and these are these uh, uh, one are the um, actual triplets we are interested uh, into so the one where we have all the symptoms of a certain disease and uh, all the symptoms that were found uh, in the case description and then we have a why or why not explanation um, apart from this we also added more simpler simple triplets uh, 
For example, here we just have uh, a sequence of triplets that states the population group uh, and uh, the uh, of the patient and which uh, disease uh, uh, the patient suffer from. And uh, these more simple uh, uh, triplets are useful uh, to kind of help the model learn in a gradual way to solve our task and indeed the usual data set for data to text approaches in the state of the art uh, right now are uh, contain this kind of uh, uh, different uh, uh, this kind of uh, examples with different difficulties. Um, so most of my work has also been based on like the architecture. Uh, so I mostly focused on trying to reproduce uh, results from some uh, um, state of the art papers and to try and see if those results could be improved. So I couldn't uh, just work with our medical data set. I needed also a um, more general domain benchmark. And uh, for me, that has been the WebNLG data set. Here we have again a couple of examples. Um, the web energy data set is bigger than ours. We have um, more or less 22,000 examples. And uh, in uh, the web energy data set, we have uh, the category associated with the, the sequence of uh, triplets. So in uh, the train and validation splits, uh, we have 10 distinct categories that uh, comes from DBpedia. And they are very general categories like airports, sports team, uh, monuments, and things like that. And then in the test split, we have uh, five additional Lancing categories that are kind of uh, used to see how well your model can generalize to kind of out of domain situations. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the architectures. We choose to um, approach the data to text problem with uh, prompting. Prompting is this new kind of new paradigm in natural language processing where instead of fine tuning your language model to solve a downstream task, what you do is uh, you adapt the downstream task to be more similar to the tasks that your language model learned to solve during the pre-training phase. And the way in which you do this in prompting is to use a prompt. Um, and uh, so the most important part, especially when you're using prompt te prompting techniques for generation is the prompt engineering phase. Uh, the first thing that you have to decide is the shape that your prompt has to has to get and uh, what we saw uh, from uh, uh, previous research is that prefix prompts work uh, really well for text generation and that's uh, mainly due to the autoregressive nature of uh, the language models uh, uh, that are used to, to generate text so we focus it on prefix prompts and then Another important factor is how much human effort goes into this prompt engineering phase, because the most intuitive way you can design a prompt is to use a natural language prompt. Uh, so you just uh, use a, a, an handcrafted uh, sequence of tokens, you put it in front of your text and just feed everything to the language model. This works quite well when the language model is quite big and when your task is not too hard. So if you have uh, uh, harder and more subtle tasks, uh, this is uh, not easy because it's not easy to handcraft uh, uh, an effective prompt. So research kind of switched to automated prompts and in particular in a natural um, language generation, what works best are automated and continuous prompts. The difference between continuous and discrete is mostly uh, related to the fact that uh, uh, um, a discrete prompt. So in both you have the prompt that's made of learnable parameters, but in a discrete prompt, the parameters are kind of bound to be, um, so the, the, the prompt token are kind of bound to be part of the uh, vocabulary of your model. Uh, while in the continuous uh, uh, prompt, the, the parameters that you use to parameterize your prompt can uh, have whatever value. And uh, prefix tuning and control prefixes are uh, uh, an example of automated prefix continuous prompts. And uh, they are very influential paper because they kind of close the gap between uh, the prompting techniques and the classical fine tuning techniques. Um, Apart from that, it's also nice to point out that uh, in prompting, you can have uh, different uh, training strategies. Uh, 
kind of depends on the shape and on the um, way that your prompt is designed. So, for example, if you use an uncrafted prompt, the prompt has no learnable parameters. So you could choose to just uh, work in a few shot or zero shot settings and don't even fine tune the language models, or you could fine tune a little bit the language model to work better with your fixed prompt. If your prompt has some parameters to train, then you could choose to fix the language model and just tune the prompt, which is what we do uh, in prefix tuning and control prefixes, or you could choose to uh, fine tune both the language model and uh, the prompt. Uh, this uh, is uh, uh, an approach that uh, has the potentiality to uh, have better results. But at the same time, it's less parameter efficient because now every time you change task, you don't just have to change the parameters of the prompt, but you have to change the whole language model. And moreover, to fine tune both the prompt parameters and the language model, it takes more data. And as I said before, our medical data set is not really huge. So uh, the best approach for us was to keep the language model fixed and then just tune the prompt. Uh, so prefix tuning. Prefix tuning, uh, as I said, it's a very influential paper in uh, uh, the prompting space for uh, text generation. And their idea is quite simple, really. They just add the new learnable parameters to every layer in the transformer. And in particular, they add uh, uh, these uh, embeddings, these new embeddings, they concatenate them to the keys and values of the multi-head attention inside every layer of the transformer. So basically here we can see uh, that uh, the uh, parameters that are tuned are in pink and purple. Um, so uh, the, the only other detail that's really important here is that the prefix has a, a length that is configurable. You can uh, uh, change it as you want, and uh, that is uh, uh, over-parameterized using a two-layer uh, uh, MLP. So basically, you just have two linear layers with a uh, uh, tan-h activation in between. And um, this over-parameterization is mostly used to stabilize learning. So um, this, is the, this is it. These are the basics of prefix tuning. The only other things to add is that in encoder-decoder models, which are very common for text generation, you actually have three different prefixes with three different parameterization because you have uh, one that produces uh, the prefix uh, keys and values for the encoder self-attention, one that produces keys and values for the decoder self-attention, and the last one for the decoder cross-attention. Um, so this is a very small scheme of how prefix tuning uh, works. Uh, as you can see, it's very intuitive. You just have the examples in your batch and you uh, concatenate this uh, general task prefix to uh, the examples. And, uh, um, however, I mean, uh, as much as it is very intuitive and it works well, uh, we have some kind of down, um, some kind of problems with uh, this approach, which is that we cannot uh, incorporate attribute level information. And uh, also the prompt is static, so it's just one. Uh, it doesn't change depending on the input. Uh, it's, uh, it's one fixed for the task and we have no way to control the generation. And control the generation is something that we care about in the context of the Antidote project because we might want our explanations to be more uh, full of technical details uh, if they are given to the doctor or less uh, technically precise if they just have to be understood by, I don't know, by a patient or uh, um, a relative of a patient or something like that. Uh, so, in light of these uh, uh, kind of uh, downsides of prefix tuning, uh, our attention kind of switched to control prefixes, which is another interesting uh, uh, paper where you use uh, some uh, guidance signal at the input level in order to uh, attach another small uh, control prefix, it's called input-dependent prefix, to uh, the, the input. Uh, the, uh, in this case, you can have dynamic prefixes, uh, and it is uh, still uh, as parameter efficient as prefix tuning because you have the exact same parameterization. So they share the, the two layer MLP. So the, this is uh, uh, very nice. Uh, so you might wondering, you might be wondering why I keep mentioning this, uh, par um, this parameterization, this over parameterization, because it's not really uh, relevant uh, to uh, the approach itself. Uh, and the reason why I keep mentioning it is that my um, 
my work has not only been focused on trying to replicate these, uh, uh, the results obtained in these papers, but also to try and see if these results could be uh, improved in some way. And the one thing that I noticed is that with this parameterization for the prefix, you basically estimate uh, you 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 have the second layer of this small MLP that uh, outputs a really huge number of neurons, uh, and then you just reshape this uh, huge output in order to be fed to uh, one part of it to the first layer of the transformer, one part to the second, and it goes on like this until the last layer. So in practice, what you do is uh, that uh, you um, you compute the prefix at a certain layer L in a way that's uh, kind of independent from uh, the prefix of the previous layers. Uh, and uh, this is kind of counterintuitive, because if you think about it, uh, the uh, features at a certain level L of the transformers are still um, computed based on the features computed at the previous levels. So there is a sort of temporal difference, uh, temporal dependence here that uh, uh, probably the model is still learning, but it's not uh, given as a prior, it's not known a priori. So um, the hypothesis here was that making this uh, temporal difference obvious for the model would uh, improve performance. And that's what we did in a very naive way, maybe because we took uh, the estimated uh, prefix at the layer L and just uh, did a weighted sum with the previous uh, estimations for the previous layers. Uh, so we added a very um, small amount of trainable parameters. But as we can see here from the table, uh, we actually were able to improve the results. These scores are the blue scores, which is a, a, an automated matrix to evaluate the text generation tasks. And uh, uh, the, the WebNLG uh, data set that we are referring here is the validation one. But anyway, we can see that we get, uh, uh, in some cases, quite small, in some cases, a little bit more relevant improvement uh, in uh, all uh, uh, the models that we tested. Um, apart from this, uh, we also reasoned on the fact that uh, task specific prefixes uh, are not dynamic in any way. Uh, so you have one task for uh, one task equal to one prefix. However, inside the same task, you might have examples that have different complexities. And in our uh, data to text data set, this is quite obvious because sometimes you have uh, uh, single triplets uh, or like just two, a sequence made of just two triplets. That's quite easy to uh, produce a description for. Uh, and sometimes instead you have four, five, ten triplets in a sequence and produce a clear into description of that is much harder. So uh, it might be nice for the prefix or at least a part of the prefix to change depending on the input because it might help um, learn how to solve in a nice way uh, examples of different complexities. Um, control prefixes are dynamic. So it might seem like control prefixes are exactly what we are looking for because they change depending on the um, uh, on the on the input. However, uh, we must remember that control prefixes can only be used if you have this conditional information to feed alongside the input. So, for example, like I might use the category of uh, the WebNLG triplets and feed the triplets and then the category to the model. Uh, and at this point, you uh, you you are able to use control prefixes. If you don't have this additional conditional information, then control prefixes cannot be used. So uh, our proposal here is to use a pool of P prefixes. Every one of these prefixes has a certain length M and is associated with a key. Um, the key can be fixed. For example, it can be the mean of the M elements inside the prefix, or it can be a learned vector that doesn't matter. Uh, then for every input to triplet, we take the embedding of this input. We compute a query vector by re-elaborating these embeddings. For example, again, we take the mean, we take the max or whatever. Uh, and at this point, we have a query vector and some keys vector. We take the similarity between query and keys and uh, just to pick the k prefixes with the highest similarity and concatenate them to the task prefix as it's shown here in this uh, in this picture uh, during training since uh, uh, both the prefixes and the keys are randomly initialized to ensure that all the prefixes get actually trained uh, in 30 percent of the cases we swap uh, the top k prefixes for some random ones and uh, and we train in this way obviously this uh, is not not done during the evaluation phase. 
So I'm now going to show you a couple of preliminary results. Please bear in mind that my internship is not actually over, so I don't have all the results right now, but uh, I'm going to show you a couple of them. Uh, so first, in this table, we can uh, notice some blue scores for the for our mental data set. Um, this check mark here indicates whether we are using uh, uh, our own custom prefix tuning implementation with the temporal de dependency or the standard one. And uh, uh, so we can see a couple of things. The first one is that every time we add the temporal dependency, the blue score actually increases. Uh, the second one is that the blue scores for our medical data set are all very high. And uh, what we can uh, reason, like the reason we can give for this is that uh, um, no matter the fact that we tried to kind of uh, augment our data set uh, using the different uh, uh, reference sentences, different descriptions, uh, we paraphrased them and everything, uh, still uh, they are mostly based on uh, uh, a single template uh, explanation, which was what we had from previous work uh, on the Antidote project. So it's reasonable that it's not too hard for the uh for the language model to imitate these templates uh, anyway here we can see a couple of uh, uh so this is a, a very simple triplet and uh, uh one of the references we have for it in the data set and the generated text and we can see that in this case uh, the model performs quite well and the, uh, the most important part is that it captures that we are trying to have a positive example so we are trying to say that the patient actually suffers from this disease um, now to go on something a little bit more complex, uh, here we have uh, uh, triplets that describe uh, a why not situation. So in this case, uh, we have all these uh, triplets that describe symptoms for the hemophilia A disease. Then uh, they are not shown here because of space, obviously, but uh, uh, we have also some triplets that describe the symptoms that this uh, girl has uh, uh, that were captured from the case description. And then finally, we have this triplet that actually states that uh, the girl doesn't suffer from uh, hemophilia E. So, as we can see from the references, uh, they are both uh, uh, why not explanations. Um, so let's see a little bit what happens uh, when the model uh, produces the outputs. So again, if we you see a check mark um, be, uh, beside the, the model name, it means that it uses uh, the uh, temporal dependencies between layers. So uh, here we have the two examples with the GPT-2 medium. We can see a couple of things. The first is that the symptoms are uh, correct in most cases. The only thing here that we have is that for, re for some reasons, the oral cavity bleeding symptom is repeated two times, which is, I mean, it's not a mistake, but uh, it's still uh, it's still a symptom of uh, some problems within our language model. Uh, but the most uh, uh, important problem here is that uh, um, this explanation generated by GPT-2 actually says that the patient might suffer from hemophilia A. We have also a spelling mistake, but that's not really important. The important thing is that the model, the model did not understand that it uh, uh, was supposed to produce a why not explanation in this case, and just produces the exact opposite using the correct information from uh, like uh, regarding the information that's present in the triplet, but just uh, uh, not uh, uh, semantically correct. Um, these other uh, examples of generation by GPT-2 uh, instead uh, recognizes that these symptoms do not occur in the case description, which is good. However, it stops there, so it completely misses the conclusion, doesn't really explain anything. It doesn't explain if this means that the patient suffers from hemophilia A or uh, if it doesn't. So we are still missing something with GPT-2, uh, despite the fact that the scores here are so high. And this brings me to one, another point that I wanted to touch briefly upon, which is the fact that using automated scores for natural language generation 
consideration uh, might not always be a very accurate way to uh, evaluate your performances because sometimes you get very high scores and that just means that your generated text has more or less all the same uh, words that were in the reference one and in more or less uh, uh, the same order but it doesn't count it doesn't account for the meaning behind those words and we can clearly see it here so let's see a little bit what happens with the other uh, models um so T5 in both cases works quite well, so it's able to um, to capture that the explanation should be a why not. But uh, once we add the temporal dependence, it starts to kind of hallucinate symptoms. So thromboembolism while brushing teeth not only is not a symptom from our triplets, probably is not a symptom at all. Uh, so it uh, invents new symptoms. Uh, while, uh, kind of shockingly enough, the BART models are those that work better. So they capture all the symptoms, don't duplicate anything, and both capture that the diagnosis should be rejected. And uh, why I say this is kind of surprising, because as you'll notice here, BART large is the one that has the lowest score, which again brings us back to the fact that uh, the blue scores are not always uh, the best uh, to, and in general, automated scores are not always the best to evaluate this type of algorithms. Um, so where could we go from here? Well, uh, I say that I pointed out how uh, the generated text sometimes hallucinates symptoms that are non-realistic or non-existent. And uh, this might, might also be due to the fact that the models that we used are actually general purpose models that don't really have any medical knowledge. They just put together the information using the triplets uh, that we that we feed in. And uh, so maybe using uh, models with the mean specific knowledge like uh, uh, BioBart or SciFi, Sci5 may uh, alleviate these issues because at that point uh, the model might not uh, make up uh, symptoms that are completely unrealistic. And this is something that we are actually working with right now. Um, another thing that uh, uh, could be done to help the models better distinguish between the why and the why not explanation is the use of control prefixes, because here we could actually quite simple as quite in a quite simple way associate to our uh, triplets a positive or negative token that uh, kind of should tell the model, uh, yes, this is a why explanation. I'm trying to uh, decide why the model, uh, why the, um, the patient has been diagnosed with this or why not. So the, the control prefixes here could actually be useful. And apart from these other uh, interesting uh, uh, line uh, of, uh, of thought here are uh, related to the data set because uh, we could uh, uh, try to use control prefixes to kind of improve the coherence of our uh, text. This is something that uh, uh, in the control prefix paper is shown to be happening when you just use the category related to the web NLG disease, uh, to the web NLG triplet. So if we add the category information to our triplets, we might be able to improve the coherence of the produced texts. And uh, uh, the other thing is related, as I said before, to the fact that uh, all our reference texts are in some way based on that single first uh, template explanations that we had, even if we just uh, paraphrased uh, that. So there, I mean, it might be simply simplistic, simplistic to um, kind of assume that all the explanations, uh, even if they are just uh, symptom based uh, explanations uh, that we could do in we could give in a medical domain uh, will be based in the will be based on those five, six, seven uh, different uh, template uh, explanations that we produce uh, using the paraphrasing tools online. So uh, that's uh, that's it. And thank you if you have any questions. Like.